Turn again to your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, if you would please. I'm going to continue talking about the trial of our faith this morning. We talked about this in Sunday school. The title of this message is Our Faith Put on Trial. Our Faith Put on Trial. So 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7, again it reads, Peter says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, that it be tried with fire, might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. James, in his writing, in the second verse, chapter 1 and verses 2 and 3, he said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. For the trial of your faith worketh patience. And so these men were emphasizing to us that trials are going to come, that our, our faith must be put on trial. And folks, I'm here to declare to us today that it is exactly that. Let me tell you, if you don't know it already by now, the United States of America, we are on trial. Our personal faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is on trial today. If you're a straight white man, especially if you're a straight white man Christian, you are definitely on trial today. Without question. And I'm going to answer the question that what is the real purpose for the trial of our faith? What's the real purpose? What's the purpose for America's to be put on trial? What's the purpose for you as an individual Christian for your faith to be put on trial? What's the real purpose for the body of Christ, for the church's faith to be put on trial? I'm going to answer that question for us this morning. It is crucial that we understand what the real purpose is. If you turn now to Psalms chapter 26 real quick. Psalms chapter 26. In verse 2, Psalms 26 and verse 2, David said, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Examine me and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. So here David is saying, Try my heart, O Lord. Put me on trial. Send me forth. I know I need to have a test. Because when I'm forced to have a test, I know that my faith, that my life, that my thoughts, that all that encompasses my person will be put in line because of the fight, the trial, the battle that will be raged. And so David says here, Lord, try me. Christian people, I encourage you, if you are a mighty Christian, if you're a mighty Christian, and not every Christian's mighty, but if you are a mighty Christian, you will pray the prayer and ask the Lord, Lord, put my faith on trial. Lord, try my heart. And then he says, try my reins. Well, let me explain to you what the reins mean. In some of your interpretations in your Bibles, they will refer to the mind. Well, it's not necessarily the mind. You see, in, 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 in biblical times, when they use the term reins, they were in referencing to that which is in control, or that which controls a person. Or that which provides or gives direction for a person. What's controlling you? David said, Lord, try what's controlling me. Try me. Try it. Because if something's controlling me that shouldn't be, then it needs to be cut away and extinguished. Amen. I need to have surgery in my heart. Try my reins. Am I being directed in the right way that I'm supposed to be directed? You see, it's as if the reins of a horse. Now, I'm not a horseman. I can't stand horses. <laughs> but I'm smart enough to know that the reins on a horse both controls the horse and tells it which direction to go. And that's exactly what David here, exactly what the scriptures mean when he says, try my heart, try my reins and my heart. He's saying, try what controls me. You see, folks, America is on trial for what controls her. Yes. I believe the church today is on trial
for what controls her. Absolutely. I think America is on trial today for the direction in which America is heading. And I believe the church today is on trial for the direction in which it is heading. And I believe each of us as individual Christian people, I think our faith from time to time needs to be put on trial to test the reins of control, to test the reins of direction, and to test the heart, the faith in a person's heart. You see, faith does not reside in a person's mind. Faith resides in a person's heart. Yeah. Heart. The scripture tells us, we read it in Sunday school, that with the heart we believe unto salvation. That the heart has its own ability to think on its own. The Holy Spirit, the scripture tells us in the book of Hebrews, that the word of God knows the intent and the thoughts of the human heart. And those thoughts and those intents are put on trial from time to time. And Peter is saying here, you're going to be put on trial and you're going to go through the fire. But if you pass the test, if you pass the test, we read it, Job said, if I pass this test, as soon as this nonsense is over, with all these boils and the sickness and everything that between God and Satan, as soon as they're through fighting over me, then I know that when I pass the test, I'm going to come out like gold. Yes, yes, yes. Now I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that's basically what he says. Amen, Pastor Charlie? That's basically what he said. Now, turn if you would to Jeremiah. Let's get to the grassroots now of what is the real purpose for the trial of our faith. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, beginning with verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. Now before I get to verse 6 and explain what's going on there. We talked about this Wednesday night in our Bible study, that folks... In the early 60s. Now listen to me now. This is why America is on trial. In the early 60s, the Supreme Court of our country, the nine-person Supreme Court of our country, declared that for the substance and the basic makeup and nature of our country, which falls under the basic public educational system that in the training and the teaching of our children in public education that God is no longer allowed. That prayer in public schools is unconstitutional. So God, you can go now, you can go now, you are unconstitutional According by the bylaws in which we rule ourselves, we have declared that you are unconstitutional in the classrooms of our children in public education. And folks, the United States of America, we are paying the price for that still even today. We cannot make up for lost time. We will never recover ourselves because of that singular act and we still are fighting basic needs of America today that should have been resolved 40, 50 years ago, but because they can't be resolved, because we have dismissed God out of the basic fiber of our society. Right. And we know that as God exits himself more and more from our lives, not only from education, but from our homes, could you imagine our children's going to come and visit us this Thanksgiving? I could not even imagine that as my children, our children, they walk into our home and I declare to them, now kids, for the next three or four days that we're together, we will not one time talk about God. I could not even imagine that. Now, I know that there are families 
who when relatives and family members come over, they can't talk about God or religion or Christianity or politics because there's such divide. And I understand that to a certain extent, but it's not religion we should be talking about. We should be talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I texted one of my grandsons the other day. I watched his videos and I texted him and I said, dude, you got what it takes. Just keep doing what you're doing. Just keep doing what you're doing. But most of all, Grandpa says, serve the Lord. Hallelujah. But most of all, serve the Lord. You see, folks, cursed, saith the Lord, cursed is a man that trusteth in man, and that maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. Verse 6. Now this is what happens. For that man shall be like the heath, or that's like the animal, the deer, or whatever, in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh. They can't see it. But shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Now folks, what he's saying there is that when a person puts their trust in man and not in God, and that's exactly what the Supreme Court did back in the early 60s. The Supreme Court said, we are going to put our trust in man, and God, you are no longer welcome. You are unconstitutional in the realms of our public discourse. It's unconstitutional. And so forth, folks, since then we have been, we have found ourselves in cursed places, trying to recover from mistakes and ailments that bewitch us and that take upon us in our lives as American uh, citizens, as Christian, individual Christian people. Folks, Christians can make all the sacrifices that they can, they can talk, all the talking points of Christianity and of religion. But when it comes time for their faith to be tested, they put trust in themselves and not in God. And when they put trust in themselves and not in God, when something good does come by, they can't recognize it. They can't see it. They can't recognize it. Thus, it goes by them. And then they wonder and they ponder why the condition remains always the same. It's because they never get past that single test. Whenever they're tried, they look to themselves rather than looking to God. Folks, there comes a time when all of us, we must completely surrender ourselves. Yes. Yes. We must surrender our faith, our minds, our souls, our hearts, and our spirits. And if we don't do that, we're going to miss when something good comes by. When the pastor says something that is a revelation, we're going to miss it because we're hearing something else. Because our lives are somewhere else and we're not, we're not trusting the Lord, but we're trusting our own selves. You see, folks, I've worked with so many people, so many different types of people over the years. And so many of them, they simply don't know how to prosper. They can't. When they have a little bit of an abundance, they spoil it away because they don't know how. Prosperity even scares them. They don't know how to be happy. They're so used to unhappiness. They're so used to arguing. They're so used to bickering. They're so used to calling one another names that to call the spouse, your spouse, honey or darling, that's like, okay, you're weird. You need to take more medication. I mean, we're used to calling one another names and jabbing and poking one another. We're used to argument. We're used to heated engagements. And whenever they get a little bit happy, something good happens. And, and you know, and kind of all the stars kind of just start lining up and everything's to be, everything seems to be going good. And, and if they get too happy and, and, and all of a sudden the stress diminishes a little bit, they, they get very uncomfortable because they're so used to stress. Because stress gives them the energy. And so this is what happens. They actually sabotage. They'll sabotage that very good thing. They'll sabotage that friend. They'll sabotage those extra finances. They'll sabotage the church. They'll sabotage the, the, that, that joy, that friendly thing. They'll sabotage that friendship. Something's going to happen because they're not used to it. You see, they can't see it when it comes their way because they're so used to putting trust in themselves and not in the Lord. Can you say amen? So they don't know how. They don't know how to be happy. They don't know how to have gladness. 
Folks, look around our communities. We have, the other day, my wife and I, we were in Spokane doing some things. And now, Spokane is just a dot on the map compared to San Francisco and Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. and New York and all those other places. It's just a dot on the map. And as we were driving through downtown Spokane, I remember 30, 40, 40 years ago, downtown Spokane was completely different than it is today. And so many homeless people just wandering, just, just wandering aimlessly, just walking, wandering around, carrying their bags with them, carrying their sacks with them, wrapped up in a blanket or carrying something. They haven't had a shower in months. You know, they just, they just, and they just wander aimlessly, wander lost in aimlessness. 